morning, everyone. We apologize for being a little bit late this morning, but the internet wasn't cooperating with us. So we're ready to go now. I'm Joanne Bundy, and I joined the planning committee in welcoming you to the bucket courses. Everything you want to learn before you kick the bucket. Uh, the a main announcement this morning is the pink sheets that are on your table. That gives you an opportunity to make comments or suggestions about the bucket courses. And not just evaluating Clark's course, but anything else that you would like us to know about uh, how you feel about the bucket courses. Uh, feel free to write it on that and to just leave the uh, slips on the table when you leave today. A planning committee pays very close attention to what you write on these because we want to have the speakers you enjoy and the topics you enjoy. So please take advantage of being able to fill this out. Now if you will silence your cell phones, I will give you some good news and bad news. <laughs> bad news first. Uh, Clark will not be able to get into the topic of the criminal mind in his four-week course uh, today. Uh, the good news is that he has agreed to come back the spring of 2015 and do a four-week course on the criminal mind. So that's all going to <laughs> And now we have Jack. Oh, and if you are interested in getting a disc uh, of, the, uh, of the programs, that uh, the classes that Clark has had, and you can sign up if you want uh, one of the uh, discs. That is $5. If you want all four, it is $15. So uh, Jack or someone will be out there to help you sign up if you're interested in it. And now it's time to get on with our class this morning. And we're happy to welcome again Clark Lindgren, a Professor of Biology at Grinnell College and Neuroscience. Clark. Actually, I'm thinking of titling the course uh, Criminal Brain, to, dis to distinguish it from the CBS series, Criminal Minds. It actually fits better with what I want to say anyway. Um, and actually, I'm a little confused because George, when he pitched this idea for me doing this, I thought the bucket course meant a course you wanted to teach before you kick the bucket. <laughs> now I see actually it's off oh, it's okay. So. <laughs> oh, so I figured I better quick do this, right? <laughs> Okay, so uh, sorry to be starting off almost in the middle of, of, a, of a lecture, but hopefully you kind of remember the stuff we talked about. In particular, we looked at the different diagnostic criteria that really are, are used, and you can go. Did anybody go to the website synesthete.org? Any, any winners? <laughs> no? Uh, they tell you pretty quickly, and, and, you know, you can try to fake them out, and I've done that. You can, you can answer the questions that would suggest your synesthete, but then you don't get very far in their battery. They have pretty good ways of of weeding out imposters. Um, and that database has been a really important research tool for David Eagleman, as we'll talk about in a, in a little bit, and in terms of gaining a lot of data about synesthetes that really previously hadn't been, hadn't been available. Um, what, what I want to start off with is, um, oh shoot, okay, I don't know why I did that. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, co-occurrence of, uh, of, of synesthesia. So many synesthetes are polymodal and that they will have multiple forms of synesthesia. They're not just graphene color synesthetes. And so here's a table that was created by uh, David Eagleman looking at other forms of synesthesia that commonly are, are found in people who have graphene color synesthesia. And one thing to note, first of all, is that most people are polymodal. Only 22% of graphene color synesthetes are only graphene color. Most of them will have another modality of synesthesia. And you can see the, the, the common forms of weekdays uh, are in color, months are in color. Um, and then there's a form on here that wasn't on the original list that I showed you. Um, and that's what's called spatial sequences. That ends up being about 50% of people who have color graphene synesthesia also have what's called spatial sequences. And that was something that really um, hadn't been appreciated until uh, David Eagleman did some of his work and kind of resurrected that idea of spatial synesthesia. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about that, and um, since it is such an interesting example, there we go, of, of 
synesthesia. So what is spatial sequence synesthesia? I'll start off by... The kind of synesthesia I have is called spatial synesthesia. That's what I've heard it called. And it means that I see uh, the alphabet and days of the week, months of the year, numbers laid out a certain way in space in front of me. So, for example, the alphabet starts up here with A and it kind of goes sloping downhill to Z and something shifts around P and Q, but I just see it a certain way. And uh, for months of the year, January starts up here. It goes sort of straight down to the summer months, and then the summer goes across the bottom, and then the fall goes down to December. It sounds really weird to other people, but it makes sense to me. I'm not sure it really affects my daily life or my work habits, but I think that because I see the days of the week and months of the year laid out the way I do, I think it helps me to remember things. So I just see it in my head, and it helps me remember what I have to do for that week. I think having synesthesia is kind of interesting, and I don't really understand how other people don't have it. I thought everybody had it until a few years ago when I read about it and realized not everybody sees things this way. So, it, like I said, it helps me remember things, and I, I like it. It makes sense to me. Uh, one of the things that David Eagleman described is that this is one of the forms of synesthesia that people are most likely to have and not realize that it's something unique. That this, for some reason, just a lot of people seems really, really natural, and they're, like she said, they're shocked even in, in, in their adulthood to find out that not everybody has that that ability. Uh, this type of synesthesia, though, was described a long time ago. Sir Francis Galton, who the, the polymath English. Uh, guy who did a lot of statistics and, and um, was just kind of dabbled, dabbled in all kinds of different things, he actually described this form of synesthesia. And so these are some of the diagrams he drew of how people saw number sequences. And um, you know, they're going off in a particular, in some cases you can see they're um, uh, fairly comp complex in how they loop around. In other cases, it's a little bit more straightforward in terms of how they, how they look. Um, as I said, David Eagleman, who's shown here, rock star of the neuroscience world, David Eagleman, who I mentioned is somebody we, we brought to Grinnell before he had superstar status um, and had, had him talk about synesthesia, among, among other things. But he was one of the people, largely through this website and others, were, which started to really begin to uh, get a much more thorough assessment of how prevalent synesthesia is and the different forms. And he really picked up on this spatial synesthesia or it's also called number form synesthesia. And he created a virtual soft, 3D virtual software that would allow synesthetes to um, really describe in three-dimensional space what, what their number forms looked like. And so for example, here's a woman who described, who saw numbers um, circling around her. And, and notice it loops behind her and then comes up around here and takes off. So that'll often have very specific, interesting geometrical arrangements that stay very, very fixed. Those are very constant. Um, here in, in this slide, these are two women, these are sisters, who both have uh, spatial synesthesia. Uh, but the thing to point out is how different their forms are. So the woman on the top, so for example, if you look at her months, I think it starts, as they're all in front of her, they start down and come back up again, whereas her sister, sees them running more linearly across across the horizon. So um, mm -hmm. as is true of synesthesias in general, they tend to be idiosyncratic. So the specific way that the person perceives the synesthetic effect is very unique to them. Yet there is a biological or heritability to it. I mean, it's not an act. There's two sisters that have both have the same kind of synesthesia, but they developed it in a different way. So those are the sorts of things that David Eagleman is looking at and, and is trying to use that to gain a deeper insight into what's happening in their brains and perhaps also get some insight into our, our brains as well. Now, uh, a couple things to note. One is, if you think about it, this is not really sensory synesthesia, right? We're not talking about color, and, you know, we're not talking about vision and hearing or even touch and hearing. These are both, if you will, sort of concepts. Uh, I mean, time, a time unit is a concept. Space is, a, you know, is, a, is somewhat sensory, but really an interesting thing that David Eagleman noted and other people had, had seen is that you could really think more broadly about synesthesia as being not just cross-sensory connections, but also other levels of brain function are, seem to be crossing as well. Is there any relationship to IQ in this? 
Uh, so the question is, is there any relationship to IQ? Um, I don't know. I, I sort of vaguely remember that that it is tends to be higher, but um, uh, and if you notice that both of the clips I showed you, the one today and the one last week, people did mention that one of the benefits is it seemed to help their memory, and that people did find that they could use it in some ways to make it easier to remember things. Uh, back, Richard. Um, what does it mean to have that linear uh, placement of the months? Does it mean you see the name of the month like that? Or do you have some different sense about the month, the, the extent of time? Or? I think it's mostly, I think they would see the name of, is that... Do you see? See what? Do you now? see the month? Do you have? Do you see the months laid out in time yeah. and space? And do you see the name of the month or just the idea? Well, of the sort of. I know it's January or whatever, but okay. it has a certain position. Position, yeah. I, I'm not really, sure. and it probably varies a lot uh, in terms of whether they actually you're actually like to actually see J A N, you know, whatever. I don't think that's necessarily true in most cases. It's but a feeling. There more probably more. are some. Yeah, some yeah. That you, well, you know it's January or you know February. I mean, they have positions in the... Mice. So they do have a real specific position in uh -huh. space. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was wondering, sometimes when I write, I don't write straight. I do it. Would that have anything to do with it? In other words, if I have no lines, I, I tend to wander. <laughs> when you're writing, if you have no lines, you tend to want to. Um, maybe. We'll come back to how uh, one of the interesting things I find about the synesthesia is not these interesting people who have this uh, interesting ability, but what it might reflect about us. And, 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 and we all, I think, have low levels of synesthesia that don't rise to the, to the extremes we're talking about. But we all do have some forms of that, I believe. Do these people tend to go to certain occupations like graphic design or? You're getting ahead of me. Yes. How <laughs> young have they researched? How young are people that they've Oh, and I, I, I didn't repeat Jim's question. So we asked what kind of occupations people go into. And there does seem to be evidence that synesthetes do go into certain types of professions uh, more readily. They presumably are using their synesthesia to an advantage. And then how young does is the synesthesia? Um, Infants. Well, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah, so basically how young does synesthesia show up? And it appears that it actually, for people who are synesthetic, for most people, they can never remember when they weren't synesthetic. So um, it seems like it's something they pretty much had their whole lives. And when people have gone and looked at, at done studies in, in even infants as young as 30 months, they had synesthesia. In fact, at a much higher rate than adults do. So it seems to be, there's one idea that synesthesia is kind of the way you're born, more or less, and that, that, that you lose that. Um, it reminds me of that Christmas movie with Tom Hanks as the, as the narrator. And adults can't hear the Christmas bell after they grow up. So maybe as children, maybe as children, you actually do make these synesthetic connections that you do lose as an adult. That could be sort of an origin. Of those sort of oh well. And again, as, as I, I'm only giving you sort of, uh, I'm trying to, you know, I'm giving you the averages. That every synesthete is very different, and this does seem to be a, a characteristic that different people have very different experiences. And so, uh, what David Eagleman's been, been able to do because he's now. Uh, using that website has been able to survey up to 20,000 people. He's starting to get a better sense of you know, how, what the more common forms are and, and how those are reflected in people. What about uh, children from a culture that has no written language? What about children from a culture that have no written language? Um, I don't know. <laughs> a lot of good research questions out there. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's good is Eagleman synesthetic himself? Uh, so the question is, is David Eagleman synesthetic? No, I don't believe so. At least not that he's admitted. <laughs> that he's admitted. Yes. I, I was going through the last half last week, and I'm sitting here just kind of astounded because I'm just like that woman. Oh. I thought everybody. There we go. <laughs> oh, so, like, Mary. What? Some revelation. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, what's the website? Citizen.org. <laughs> 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 oh. Very interesting yeah. conversation.
conversations with <coughs> friends, asking them, well, what's yours look like? And what did they say? What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have a discovery in this class. <laughs> At a very young age, discovered that she had synesthesia yeah. or, or version of synesthesia. There we go. Um, oh, okay, so so that's really cool. That's, that's really cool. And, and is, it, is it months or days of the week? Or? Uh, uh, days of the week and... And, and can you, with your arms, show how the months yeah. go? Oh, um, let's see. Where you want to stand up so people can see? <laughs> stand on the chair. So no. I'm, still, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I'm still just kind of shocked and astounded. But, but this is February, and, and February is here. Okay? Like a circle. And February is here, and then, and then March. Oh, it's going all wrong. Here. <laughs> 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 and there's a step that's kind of coming. So the summer comes out here, and then, uh, let's see, um, August hmm? would be about, would be about here. And, uh, and then December uh, it would be right here. It's like a uh, turn on my face. It's like oh, clockwise. Oh, yeah. Does it go clockwise? Too? Uh, I, I just, uh, no, clockwise. clockwise. I just clockwise. Yours goes clockwise? But also, um, it's like squares on a on a monopoly board. Like squares on a monopoly board. Okay. They're yeah. all square. Oh. They're all square. Oh, mine are different shapes. <laughs> Let's fight it out. <laughs> Say February, I'll think of myself as being a peer. Um, the weeks, uh, weeks are uh, on a on a on a plane. Mm. The weekend has a little bump up. Uh, <laughs> Sinks yeah. down for me. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then Monday, Monday's the first one down, and then it, it goes. Oh, Monday starts up high. Straight. Until Friday. Mm -hmm. And then it goes to uh, for the weekend. <laughs> but, but do you have value and texture? Pardon me? Do you have dark and light and texture? No, no. It's oh, not. yes. I don't have any. Yeah. Dude, that's good. I have one. <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't. I'm debating whether that you two need the class now. <laughs> Go off in a corner and work this out. <laughs> well, yes, that's what it looks like. Only it's different. Here we go. I'm trying to think what happens like when I take a history class. That is interesting. This is at synesthesiatest.org. Uh, I was has just a picture of just what she just said. Synesthesia.org. Dot org. Dot org. Okay, so dot org. Yeah. 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 Y
So one of the questions is you might you might be thinking to yourself, well, I don't have anything quite that elaborate, but it, it is the case that everybody has um, usually has some sort of idea of number sequences. So for example, for most people who uh, live in the Western, where we, where we write from left to right, you probably think of lower numbers is going you know, like from one to 10, they would probably be laid out more or less from left to right. And in fact, that's been studied. Yes. Uh, again, remember using those, that computer trickery that I was telling you about where you can measure the delay between people's responses? And even though it's a very, very subtle delay that can give you some insights into how much brain processing they're having to do, and the more quickly they can make responses, that generally means they have a tighter association. And so when people are asked to answer questions where they're going to give a low number, like one to five, and they use their left hand to press the key, they go faster than if they're asked to use their right hand. So that's kind of this idea of being laid out in space. And that seems to be a pretty robust finding. It's called the snark effect. Uh, which I had to write that down. It's called uh, Spatial Numerical Association of Response Codes. So there's the snark effect. And the really interesting thing is if you cross your hands and do it like this, now it's your right hand that uses lower numbers. Than, so it's not a handed thing. It really is. There seems to be, you just more quickly associate a low number with this side of your body than a higher number. So it seems like there's a certain sense in which this is true for all people. Uh, but what distinguishes true synesthetes, and if you take the synesthete.org quiz uh, test battery, you'll find that, um, that for synesthetes, as you know, we just heard, the experience is really very much experienced explicitly in three-dimensional space. It's not just a vague sense of going from here to here, mm -hmm. but there's a pattern and it might loop around the person and come mm -hmm. up and swing, swing, swing around and have all kinds of specific uh, arrangements in three-dimensional space. And that will stay fairly fixed, right? I mean, that's kind of always the way it is. You don't, it doesn't vary from, depending on how you're feeling or whatever, you tend to always have that very fixed sense of, of experience. Um, it also is often, and I'll be curious to see whether that's been your experience, it's often panoramic and, and dynamic. And so some synesthetes will say they can zoom into a particular month or day of the week if they want to. They can look at it from different perspectives. Like if, you, if you're thinking about a particular month or a day of the week, can you zoom in and kind of see it from a different angle? Or is it always the same perspective that you have? Yeah, I don't. You never thought about it? Okay. I mean, when, when this has been looked at, people can actually kind of walk around in their mind and sort of see it from different angles, and they might even be able to zoom in. I don't know if that, I mean, that's not true of everybody, but that's one of the things that's been described. Um, and also, some forms are colored. I and mean, if you say you have colors. Color. Yeah. So if, there's a couple of examples that people have drawn. So this is like, for example, a, a, a month, which has a, a month sequence synesthete who not only has a physical dimension, but also the different months will have a different color, and that will stay fixed as well. Um, here's an artist I'll be talking about a little bit later. This is uh, Carol, uh, I forgot her name already. She, oh, Carol Stein. Steen, Carol Steen, who has a really elaborate form of synesthesia, where I, I'm guessing, because the way this was described, she does sort of see months in a little bit of, uh, that actually are kind of written out for her, as opposed to just being in space. Hmm. All right, so, uh, so they can actually overlap with color as well. So anyway, glad I did that, because that, um, that is a very common form of, of synesthesia, and it's a really interesting one to begin, because it's not really truly linking senses in the way that we originally started talking about it, but it's linking something else at a higher level, a higher cognitive level. So let's go back to color graphenes. I wanted to tease out a few more details about colored graphenes. This, again, is the most common form of synesthesia, the one that you've heard of, if, if you've heard of synesthesia at all. Um, so a few interesting things about color graphenes that you might not uh, realize. One is that for most people, um, it's the input sense doesn't really matter as much as you would think. So they will make associations between letters and colors or numbers and colors, regardless of whether they're seeing it hearing it, or even just thinking it. So it's at, a, it's at a higher level than just the initial sensory process. Although there are some exceptions here, and, and some researchers distinguish lower synesthetes from higher synesthetes, 
not indicating any relative importance, but the lower, there are some lower synesthetes who do seem to make the connections at a lower level. So in those cases, they might only have the experience when they see it. But for most synesthetes, 90% who have this colored graphemes, they will have the experience of the color regardless of how, the, how that's presented to them. Um, and another interesting thing is that if the color depends on their focus of attention. So for example here, if you take um, little twos and form them into a shape of a five, the question is what does the synesthete see, the color associated with two or five? And the answer is it depends on what their focus of attention is. So if they focus in on the details, they see the color for two. If they focus on the, on the bigger picture, the five, they see the color of, of, of green or whatever that's associated with five. So again, it's really their, it's their focus, and again, it, it goes away from this idea that it's not a simple sensory mix-up or something that's happening at a very early level in processing, but it's a, a larger concept that, that triggers the colors. Um, and actually, this is, this is sort of a follow-up. So it really is the concept of the letter um, or the number that matters and not, and not the shape itself. Now there's another kind of synesthesia where the shape does matter, but in, in the typical colored graphemes, um, it's, it, for most people, it's actually the concept. And so the way to illustrate that is to, for example, take a letter like J, which could either be uppercase or lowercase or even written in script. Most synesthetes would see that the same regardless of how, regardless of the font of the character. Um, they might some describe maybe the uppercase is a little bit brighter, more dynamic, but generally they will they will see those all all as being the same, which indicates again it's the concept of J as opposed to um, the particular shape, the physical shape of the letters. Another really interesting way to see that is take a word like this, okay, the cat. So the question is, what does a synesthete see for the middle letter in each of those words? They're identical. The letters are shaped exactly the same. However, they will see the, the H and the in a different color than the A and cat, mm -hmm. even though they're identical. So again, it's, their, it's the concept more than the actual physical appearance of the letter. If they're thinking concept H, they see it in one color. If they think concept A, they see it as a different color. Okay. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, some people uh, are what are called localizers versus non-localizers. So some people, their synesthesia is more of something that's in their mind's eye. They might just have a color or a sensation with it. For more, more, more people, though, they're, they're actually localizers where they actually will see the color in a particular place in space. Sometimes it overlays the actual letter they're seeing. Um, and in that case, some people describe it as being kind of like colored cellophane that you put over, over something and you're looking through the colored cellophane and it tints the color a certain way. Uh, others actually describe it as, as obscuring the original letter and, and they can only sort of see the color. So there's a variety of ways that people experience it. Um, in some extreme cases, and these are more the cases of people who have this form of synesthesia and it becomes very disruptive for them, is they will actually have what are called photisms, which are sort of like hallucinations, but they're very vivid. And so they will have a particular synesthetic experience where the thinnest, what they're seeing, the color they're seeing, obscures everything else. And it can actually, obviously, if you're driving along the road, it can actually be a bit of a problem. And so these are very rare, but they actually do have very, very vivid visual experiences. Um, oh, and, and so, um, Again, with David Eagleman being able to look at so many different people, he's actually been able to ask them, you know, what color is, is, is A, what color is B, what color is C. And one of the things that he found was that there tend to be sort of common associations. And again, everybody's different, and so there's this idiosyncratic nature of synesthesia. But by and large, um, you, you find a trend. So for example, O's and zeros are often white. A is very commonly red. B, blue, C, yellow, for example, and there are going to be some variants on that. And an interesting thing about the trends that, that he has observed is that they do follow um, the sequence with which children learn colors. So the first color a kid will usually recognize is red. It's also really, anthropologically, that's also really interesting. In certain cultures, they don't have as many colors that they talk about as we do. And if there are cultures that only have one color, it's usually red. So that's a more, that's, it's one that's learned earlier, it seems to be a more common 
color that people recognize. Red tends to be associated with the graphemes that show up more regularly, um, maybe earlier on when they're learning the alphabet or more commonly in words that they see. Whereas when you get to other more obscure, more, more uh, uh, subtle colors, those are more less common graphemes. And then uh, lastly, uh, graphemes in some people can also take on personalities. So not only do the numbers or colors have, excuse me, not only do the numbers have colors, but they'll also have personalities. So for example, this um, synesthete uh, sees two as being a, I don't know what color these are, but two is a shy, wimpy boy. Nine is a vain, elitist girl. <coughs> Four is a plain but decent, hard-working older woman. <laughs> and she says that she hates the, num she hates the number 49 or 94 because she hates seeing those two numbers together because their personalities clash. Uh, another really interesting uh, example is Pythagoras, who is the uh, 500 BCE, the famous uh, philosopher, mathematician. He is the one that we taught the Pythagorean theorem. He, he uh, did, did, you know, was kind of one of the first mathematicians. He apparently, it looks like he had this kind of synesthesia where each number had its own personality. It was either masculine or feminine, uh, perfect or incomplete, beautiful or ugly. And he wrote about that somewhat. Um, and this feeling, of course, modern mathematics is completely, doesn't, doesn't talk about, but you still find overtones of this, not only in fiction and poetry, as uh, R.S. Brumbaugh, who is a historian who studied Pythagoras, but also really, really uh, kind of humorously, uh, not so much historians, but, but people who have become aware of and have read Pythagoras and have realized he had this association between numbers and personalities, thought that maybe he had a really deep insight into numbers or even the universe. And so he was actually describing a really deep, profound feature about the universe. And so actually, if you Google that, you'll find there's a, there's a variety of New Age movements that are based around some of those ideas. These are numerologists who are always trying to figure out things about numbers that don't have anything to do with their actual number, but their, their significance. I uh, hate to tell them, but they're probably a little bit misguided if they're looking for Pythagoras for deep insights. He probably was synesthetic, and that's what he was talking about, and people weren't, weren't real. They just thought it was kind of an odd feature, or they looked at it too deeply for, for um, significance. Um, one minute. Okay, I'll start this next topic and then we'll, we'll pick up after the break. So, uh, not only is there colored uh, graphemes, but there's also colored hearing. People will actually have associations between things that they hear and colors. And here's, this is bad, the first half of that chart I showed you earlier, which listed the different um, forms of synesthesia that had been recognized. Uh, and so here, up here at the top, these are the grapheme colors. But notice the next one down are a variety of sounds that actually our people perceive as colors. So musical yeah. sounds, general sounds, phonemes, mm -hmm. and actually musical notes can take on colors. And so right after the break, I want to start talking, just give you a brief overview of that, um, because that's also another very fascinating form of synesthesia that particularly relates to music and, and uh, uh, the, perhaps the explains the skills of some uh, famous musicians in the past that had a, that had a synesthetic experience. So, we'll stop there for a short break. Do that again. There is so much to talk about during the break that it's hard to get back to the we will now go on to the rest of our class this morning on the neuroscience. Mark Lindgren. Okay. So if we can have the lights down a little bit on that. Uh, well, I bet that's yeah. good. <laughs> Technical problems. So there we go. Okay. So uh, continuing on with, with color hearing. And so I wanted to just go through some of these. These are also really, really fascinating forms of synesthesia. So you'll notice that one of the uh, more... <coughs> One of the forms of, of um, sound to color synesthesia which is just categorized as general sounds. And so those might be things like a dog barking, and somebody will see a color, or a pattern, or uh, a bell ringing. Or in some cases, um, this woman here described this is what the uh, 
furnace sounds like when it's starting up, the whoosh of a furnace that's just kicked on, and it basically looks like that. It has these colors and sort of a pattern that goes through space. So those would be general sounds uh, that are reflected in synesthesia. There also are phonemes, and so a phoneme as opposed to a grapheme is actually how something sounds as opposed to how it looks. And so there are some people who have synesthesia to words or, or letters, but they're not sensitive to the, what it looks like, they're sensitive to what it sounds like. And the way you can tell that is, for example, the letter E will look different depending on whether it's a long E or a short E. So a longer E will have a different color for them than a shorter E. So clearly the sound of the, of the letter is, is what's triggering the synesthesia. Or another one, people who have, uh, these are called homo, homophones. So these different, or different words, no, these are different words that, that sound differently. So for example, depending on whether this is the wind blew me here versus um, wind a clock, yeah. So basically wind, wind, those would look very different to, to phonemes. Now these are not as, nearly as many people who have this kind of synesthesia as a graphene type, but it's another version of that. <laughs> And you have to be kind of tricky when you're distinguishing these because people often, even if they, like they might be a phoneme uh, linked or, or hearing linked to synesthetic, and you might think they're grapheme linked because even though they're looking at a word, they might be saying it in their mind, and that actually will be enough to trigger the synesthetic experience. Um, and you have to really like look at wine. They have to use two sentences that had the word wind and wind in it to really see that they had a, they were more phoneme based. All right, cool ones now. So. Musical sounds, this is really, really interesting, and it's one of the more common forms of, of colored hearing. So that could range all the way from um, like musical sounds, like even like a bell or something like that, or more, more interestingly, it'll relate to some um, type of music, like the, the timbre of the music or the tone of the, the quality of the tone, like a violin versus an oboe. The differences there are the tom is called timbre. And here's an example of, of a woman who describes uh, violins and stringed instruments evoking a nice medium shade of green. <laughs> Piano music is white, um, which is kind of interesting because this person might have heard white, might have heard piano music earlier on, and so associates this kind of whiteness with that, which is a more basic color. Uh, and a piano concerto with a lot of strings, you put both of those together, evokes a green background with white in the foreground, so you can sort of match, match them together. Uh, Mozart's clarinet concerto is a wonderfully deep shade of blue, and the music of a flute is red. So, for example, these are examples of musical sounds that evoke synesthesia. But the most interesting ones are actually musical notes that some people have synesthesia with. And when we're talking about musical notes, uh, there really are two aspects of that. One is the actual pitch. So that would be the frequency um, of, of, the, of the tone. A is 440, 440 hertz or cycles per second. And so there's actually a physical pitch, and some people clearly make their synesthetic associations with the actual pitch frequency. Others, there's also the pitch class, which would be, you know, that C, C sharp, D, and so forth. Actually, they will make more of a synesthetic connection with the class of, of the particular pitch. Um, in both of those cases, it's, it's interesting that for people who have uh, this kind of synesthesia, there's again a common, there's a commonality in that they will usually have um, a nice ordering of lower pitches or lower pitch class up to higher pitch classes, and they'll follow a logical transition from maybe being darker at the lower notes to brighter on the higher notes. Or if they're seeing unique colors, they will it'll be kind of stand out like a rainbow where they'll have darker purples and blues in the lower notes and more brighter oranges and reds in the higher notes. And so there is this sort of for most people, they kind of have a, a, a sort of you say a sort of a logical arrangement of their of their synesthesia. And that actually makes sense if you look at how the brain processes sound. So here is, a, is we're looking at the temporal lobe, the part of the brain which contains the primary auditory cortex. So this is the part of the brain that does the initial processing of sound. And one of the first things that gets uh, detected is the frequency or the pitch of the sound. And if you look in this area, you can see that the different frequencies are arranged tonotopically, so they're arranged from one end to the other in a nice orderly way. So lower pitches um, are at this end of the cortex, and then higher pitches get detected and processed up here. So that nice arrangement of the brain in this physical mapping, it would make sense then that that might map 
into other domains in a similar logical way from dark to light and then from different colors and certain ways, however those are processed. Okay. Um, in addition to pitch and pitch class, there are things like the musical key, minor, major keys will often look very different in terms of their colors or even C major versus A minor, those will have very different colors. Um, again, as I mentioned before, the timbre of the music, the, the type of uh, tone quality. Interesting, the word timbre comes from the German word, um, and I wrote this down so I know I forget this, um, uh, Klang Farm, which means literally tone color, which is interesting that the <laughs> early description of timbre had the word color in it. It's, well, maybe the person who did that had a little bit of synesthesia and was thinking of, of tones as having, or timbres as having different colors. And then also chords. So if you play two notes simultaneously, some people are synesthetic or they will associate colors with the interval between, you know, like a minor third will, will have a different color than a major third or a major fifth or whatever. So the intervals will also elicit colors. Um, some famous uh, musicians, uh, composers like Korsakov, uh, it was considered uh, a, clearly a synesthetic uh, person. Also Franz Liszt, and they were contemporaries and would have long heated debates, just like we saw here, about the colors of different keys. No, 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 it's red. No, 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 it's yellow, and so forth. And they would actually fight about that in front of people. Um, Liszt surprised, uh, here's a quote from, the, from Liszt, when he went to the uh, when he first went to the Kapellmeister Orchestra, uh, people were really shocked when he said things like, "I'll try to do a list impression." I don't, I don't even try that. You know, oh please, gentlemen, a little bluer, if you please. This tone type requires it. Or later on, that is a deep violet, please. Depend on it, not so rose. And they had no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> Crazy. They probably tried to accommodate him in some way by by doing that. But he was clearly seeing colors in these different tone types that his orchestra was producing. <laughs> Eric, Eric has the same thing done. I guess I, I'm, I was a former music <coughs> teacher, and I, I used to do a lot with art and music listening with young children. And, you know, I wasn't aware of any of this. I never learned anything about this before. But I have to say that in a classroom of children, they're seeing color all the time. I mean, that's just, for all of you to laugh at what he just said, they would, they would debate that issue. To no yeah. end, you know, I mean, maybe it's their creative minds, but I guess what I'm saying is that different level of, of this, some seats, um, I don't know, you know, I don't know how many of them might have, somebody in that classroom might have been seeing a certain color all the time, but. Okay. At what age that, was that? Uh, uh, elementary children, but elementary more, children. more so with the, with the primary. Kindergarten, like, first, second, third grade. I did third, with them yeah. a lot, and they, they were so into that, and yeah. so defined, you know, definite about their colors and what they heard yeah. through music. So I'm not going to try to rephrase that question exactly, but except the observation that younger children in the primary grades seem to that they, they would have been shocked by this, and they actually um, see are more likely to res to associate musical sounds with colors, that sort of thing. And that is consistent with research that seems that synesthesia does start really early, and maybe is even very very common. I'll show you some research a little bit that suggests that, uh, and then it kind of gets lost as you get into adulthood. This might be a much more common thing. George, do you, th do you think that losing it is conditioned by trying to be like everybody else rather than unique? In the kids? In the kids. So the question is, is it are they just being conditioned by trying to be like everybody else? I, I don't know. I mean, I think people have actually tested it, and they do have, they do the find question. higher levels of synesthesia. There might be a little bit of both going on. They, they're probably also very suggestible, and they like it. I mean, there's two different ways you can think about this. Um, I mean, you know, we can all sort of imagine uh, you know, make associations between colors and things, but our true synesthesia really is a very, very vivid, elementary, very automatic response. And so, when um, when Korsakov and Liszt were fighting, they really were fighting because, you know, not that they just had a different idea of the music, but they really saw the keys in different colors. And so, that's a little bit different than something that's more possibly generated by associations. But at some point in, in development, the kid makes the association as well. I mean, they're basically seeing it, and they start making associations too. So it's probably a complicated answer to that. Um, someone who, and this may have been asked uh, last week, Clark, someone who is born blind, um, 
have they been tested? What? Yeah. So the question is, theirs if, if, be taste, smells, yeah. what? Yeah. People who are born blind, uh, some of them are synesthetes, and they will actually see colors. Uh, oh, and, and, really? and when they hear sounds, they will they will see colors. It's, it's more common to people who become blind later on, but but yeah, there are documented cases of synesthetes who are blind. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which for them is you know it's kind of neat. They actually get to use that whole part of their brain that they normally get to use. How do they know what they're called? Um, yeah. Uh, so, so this is getting to what we were just talking about. So is everyone synesthetic to a degree? And so when we look at this particular type of synesthesia, there have actually been some studies that have looked at that. So for example, this study done by Lawrence Marx found in a large population that people do tend to make associations between the pitch, which is on the vertical axis, and things like size and brightness. So people will tend naturally to associate higher pitches with brighter colors and smaller size in the same way they would do for loudness. So loudness, they tend to associate with brightness uh, as well as larger size. So that does tend to be, that's been studied enough in normal populations to say that, again, like that left-right thing I was telling you about, there is a somewhat of a synesthetic relationship between uh, pitch and color and other things uh, in the general population. So here's your test. Can you hear that? Ready? <laughs> so um, a couple of psychologists used this test on 30-month-old infants, and they asked them that, that same question. And so you see the white and the, and the dark ball falling, and they would change it up, and sometimes the test would be the, the lower pitch, sometimes it would be the higher pitch. And they always, I mean, universally, they responded um, that, the, that the higher pitch is associated with the lighter ball. So again, this idea that that synesthetic connection goes back really far. And 30 months, you can't really ask a kid younger than that to really respond, and so it's hard to know whether that even goes farther back um, in time. People are probably starting to look at that now with eye trackers and things like that, which you can use to um, indirectly figure out what infants are, are thinking. Um, you can tell when they're surprised by looking at their pupil diameter, and their pupil will change when they're surprised. And so, Psychologists have done clever experiments to show that, for example, infants as young as six months know the laws of physics. Um, at least they know that if they see an image where a ball should fall off a, a, a table and it goes up, that, that, that strikes them as weird because their pupils will dilate. And so anyway, that's the digression. Uh, so this will be cited, I'm sure, in synesthesia. But again, this idea that there is this very common sense of, of connection. Uh, ventriloquism is, you know, if you think about why do we fall for ventriloquists, uh, because we quickly associate the movement of the ventriloquist's mouth, not the, I mean, the dummy's mouth, not the ventriloquist's mouth with the sound, and we make that connection automatically. And in fact, uh, talkies, you know, movies that have, that have sound, you know, where people are talking in the movies, you know about that? Um, the, the, early on when the engineers were first trying to figure out how they were going to make this work, they struggled really hard to get the soundtrack synced up really, really tightly with the video track. Because they said if they did, people just won't be able to do it. It turns out yeah. it can be really sloppy. And you don't really start to notice that weird foreign film thing until that they're really, really far apart. And so we really have this natural ability to sync up sound with, um, with lip movement, that kind of thing. Which brings me to the, the fourth example. At any one moment, we are being bombarded by sensory information. Our brains do a remarkable job of making sense of it all. It seems easy enough to separate the sounds we hear from the sights we see. But there is one illusion that reveals this isn't always the case. Doesn't have to be cut again. Ba, ba, ba. Have a look at this. What do you hear? Ba, ba, ba. Your ba, right? Ba, ba, ba. But look what happens when we change the picture. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Ba. And yet, the sound hasn't changed. In every clip, you are only ever hearing ba with a B. Ba, ba. 
Bah. It's an illusion bah. known as the McGurk effect. Bah. Take another bah. look. Bah. Bah. Concentrate first bah. on the right of the screen. Bah. Bah. Now to the left bah. of the screen. Bah. Bah. The illusion occurs bah. because what you are seeing clashes bah. with what bah. you are hearing. Bah. In the illusion, um, what we see overrides what we hear. So um, the mouth movements we see as we look at a face can actually influence what we believe we're hearing. If we close our eyes, we actually hear the sound as it is. If we open our eyes, we actually see how the mouth movements can influence what we're hearing. Ba, ba, ba. It's a bizarre ba, effect. Ba, Remember, the ba, only sound you're hearing is ba, ba with a B. Ba, 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 ba. What's remarkable about this illusion is even knowing how it's done doesn't seem to make a difference. The effect works no matter how much you know about the effect. I've been studying the McGurk effect for 25 years now, and I've been the face in the stimuli, I've seen stimuli thousands and thousands of times, but the effect still works on me. I can't help it. The speech brain just takes in that information and doesn't care about what outside knowledge you bring to bear. So that's called the McGurk effect, and then again, it's an indication that all of us have that, and that's a, it is a is a form of, of synesthesia, at least where we're, where what we're hearing and seeing are actually being mixed together in a way that can fool us. Okay. Um, so moving along, I have a couple more things I want to do, and maybe get to some questions. So if I'm rushing, stop me and, and ask me questions. I don't want to rush if you want to dwell on any of these things a little bit longer, but. Um, so I wanted to link this to art, poetry in general, and synesthesia, which seems like a natural link. Not... Okay, there we go. So the question is, and I think this was asked, you know, is synesthesia more common, for example, in some professions, in particular art? Is, is it more common among artists? And that's been generally assumed uh, for, for many years. It's never been really rigorously tested. So the answer, answer, answer is really no, we don't know. Um, it hasn't been tested in a large enough group, but there is it. There are some suggestions that, in fact, that's the case. And so, uh, here is one study that was done, uh, which uh, is kind of gives a sense. This was actually looking at uh, students uh, at a university and uh, looking at the percentage of people who were known synesthetes versus non-synesthetes in terms of the percentage that have entered, you know, went into art, design, uh, or entertainment occupations. And you can see there's more, many more synesthetes. Uh, formal art or music training is much, much higher for synesthetes versus non-synesthetes, even people who have hobbies in art. So there does seem to be, there's suggestions that in fact that mm -hmm. assumption is correct, that people in synesthetes <laughs> tend to be more commonly people who go into art, which is, which is interesting. Uh, and there are some artists that use their synesthesia quite deliberately, and I, I really enjoy some of these. So one of the artists is this um, woman, Carol Steen, and she this is a sculpture that she made, and she... Um, she sees, or, yeah, she sees sound in particular shapes or patterns. And so the first name of, of, of Dr. Sykowick, who's somebody that's worked with her on, on her synesthesia, has tried to describe her synesthesia, she sees the word cyto in a particular way, and I can't remember exactly how she sees it, but it has two parts, and so there's the bottom sort of tripod part, and then there's that top structure, and that's what she sees every time she hears the name cyto. And see how she has kind of a curly cued structures kind of bending up? That second thing spins off like that in her in her in her imagination. So she took what for her was just a natural synesthetic experience every time she heard the word Saito was part of Saito the guy's name. And she made a really kind of neat sculpture. And I like it. I don't know. I, I, I would I'd probably buy this thing if it was suitably priced. I, I, I like it. She's also done some interesting painting, and so she has a very vivid um, sound to color synesthesia. So she painted this. This painting is called um, uh, Clouds Rise Up. And she saw this when somebody was playing a flute solo. Um, and the music, I couldn't find what the actual song was. But apparently it was like a like that. And she said every, every sound had two colors, um, kind of red and green, and, and a particular shape. And they would kind of float up. And so she would see that, and they would float up. And so then she went and painted this. And I kind of like this, too. Um, an interesting thing about this, these artists is that they're not, in, in her case, she's a bona fide synesthete. Um, she can recreate this whenever she wants. So it's not like she just listened to a piece of music, and then she went and did this art. 
she can play the music and she sees exactly the same thing every time she plays that music. I mean, it's, it's that fixed in space and time. And so, you know, she can be, she says some of her art she does while she's listening to the music. And it's very easy in a way for her to do that because she's, of course, she has to have technique and ability to, to make the, do the strokes and all that right. But she can actually make really kind of neat art and it's what it really is for her. She also has uh, a synesthesia, which is um, in which uh, physical touch generates different uh, images. And so here she was undergoing acupuncture and she had her eyes closed and this is what she saw when the needles were in a certain place. She saw this kind of blobby thing and so she just went and painted it. Uh, so that's an example of, of, of actual real uh, hardcore synesthete who's, who's using that in her art. Another one, this is one I really like, this is an artist, uh, uh, Muriel, oh, Marcel Smilik. She's a, she calls herself a reflectionist. She takes photo photography of things that are reflecting in the water. And when she started doing this, she had no um, photography training, no expertise. She would just go around, wander around, until she saw something that sounded cool. And so she was looking at a lot of reflections, and when it sounded neat, she would then take the picture and use her sound to determine whether it was an interesting picture or not. She calls this cello music, because when she saw this image, she heard the sound of cello music, mm -hmm. which I can, I can almost hear that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, this one, I really like this one, um, it's, this is called Red Buoy, and here the, the color is being created by bright light reflecting off of a red buoy, and for this, she hears what she calls sirens, which is not like the annoying sirens on, on uh, fire trucks, but the way she described it is more like the siren sound that she imagines Ulysses heard, um, oh, no. more of a, of, a, of a really appealing, a sound that really drew her to it, and a very, very neat kind of experience. And it's better on my screen than there. I like this too. I buy both of these for $10.95. <laughs> <laughs> this one I wanted to show you because this is a, a one where she was just going around looking at things reflecting in the water because apparently that's similar to the kind of synesthetic experience she has. And she said the sound that she heard when she looked at this, and you can actually make out there's some kind of bridge or something there, but the sound for her was the same sound she heard when she was a child that had a fever. And she re remembers telling her mother, why is my fever singing to me? Uh, because she would actually hear the sound that was triggered, in her case, by this physical sensation of a fever. So, so those are some examples of clear synesthete uh, artists who have used their synesthesia to great effect. There also are some pseudo-synesthetes, and by that I don't mean anything derogatory. But for example, Georgia O'Keeffe, um, this, is, this is called Blue, Green, Blue and Green Music, and it is, kind of looks very similar to what we just saw, Carol, some of Carol Steen's work. Um, this is music in pink and blue. Um, she is not synesthetic, was not synesthetic, um, and never claimed to be. So that, to point out that you don't, I mean, it's not necessarily all people who are painting things that, or look, doing things that have synesthetic associations are not necessarily synesthetic. It's a more general thing you can all appreciate. And in fact, there's a school of, of poetry that's, that really builds on, that actually the poets are really intentionally trying to be synesthetic in their poetry and, and not necessarily having that unique ability, but they are still trying to be synesthetic. And so here's an example of a poem, I'm not familiar with Arthur Rimbaud, but I did come across this when I was looking up synesthetic stuff. And this does sound like synesthesia, right? A black, E white, I red, U green, O blue, someday I'll crack your nascent origins. A black hairy corset of gaudy flies that bumble around cruel stinks, gulf of darkness. Uh, e, canyons of vapors and intense spheres of proud glaciers, white kings, flutter of flower clusters. Mm -hmm. I, deep reds, coughed up blood, laughter of lips, beautiful of anger, of petulant ecstasy. U, cycles, divine vibrations of seas growing green, peace of the pasture sown with animals, peace of the wrinkles that alchemy stands on studious brows. O, oh, supreme clarion full of strange silences, silences crossed by worlds and angels. O, oh, Omega, that violent ray of his eyes. I like the poem, and it is very synesthetic, but there's no indication that this poet was actually a, a true synesthete. And interestingly, if you remember what I was just telling you about it, this, this does sort of violate the expectations you would have for a synesthete. Notice his colors don't line up. Uh, a is not red. Um, 
you know, he is white. I mean, not to say that that couldn't be true for synesthetes, but first of all, his numbers, I mean, his letters don't, don't match up with what are commonly seen to be the colors most people associate with them. And the other thing that I notice on this is that synesthetes usually have a very elementary experience. It's, it's usually quite simple, very bold, and not quite as elaborate as this, even though this makes for very good poetry. I like it, but that isn't really necessarily, that part of it is not something that most synesthetes describe. They don't see A as being um, flies that are bumbling around cruel stinks. You know, that's not generally the synesthetic experience. It could be an extension of that, but just so, so there are um, pseudo synesthetes who are looking like they're, they're making synesthetic connections, but they don't necessarily have that, that natural ability. Regardless of pseudo synesthetes or synesthetes, um, it, is, it does seem to be the case that artists um, of, of all types, mus musicians as well as painters and poets in particular, they do uh, have, seem to have a particularly good ability at making metaphors. And, I mean, they see connections between things that we just don't see, and we like that. We like it in poetry, we like it in art, if they make these connections. And so, um, so for example, I already mentioned a couple of these metaphors, like a loud tie, uh, cool jazz, sharp cheese, sour note. We understand those pretty readily. We don't need to have synesthesia to sort of understand what's being meant by those metaphors. Um, and it actually noticed that a lot of metaphors, not all of them, but a lot of them are uh, sensory crossovers. So a physical shape with a taste, uh, similarly a taste with a musical note and so forth, sound and, a, and something that um, is visual and so forth, the music and, and, a, and a color or a, a temperature. Um, and so that suggests, one of the things that people have studied metaphors suggests that the phenomenon of making uh, of understanding metaphors is really pretty basic and pretty deep in the human experience it might be a very general property that we all have and maybe synesthetes are able to exploit that with greater effect than, than we can uh, but an example to support that have you heard of the buba kiki experiment okay so back in uh, 1929 uh, anthropologists first used this um, they went around to a variety of different cultures all across the world that had different kinds of languages, different cultural experiences, and they showed them these two shapes. And they said, one of them is called Buba, and one of them is called Kiki. Which one is which? And 98% of them throughout the world, throughout cultures, even today, Buba's on the left, Kiki's on the right. Why? Yeah. Maybe if you think of the way the word, the way you make the word, the way it sounds, booba sounds more rounded, um, kiki is more sharp and pointy. So again, this notion of metaphors and crossing sensory modalities seems to be a really pretty basic, primitive feature that is, that is characteristic of all people. So that leads me to my hypothesis. Um, oh no, I'm sorry, I have a couple more things to say. Yeah, some good poetry. Emily Dickinson was really great. I won't, take the time to read through her entire poem, but she uh, really just uses metaphors throughout it, and that's one of the things that makes her poetry so, uh, so interesting and so enjoyable to read. Uh, mixing all kinds of, of, of and I'm, there's no indication that she's necessarily synesthetic, but she does a really nice job. She seems to have that ability to see metaphors really closely. This is, I never saw this poem before I came across this. E. Cummings made a poem. I don't know if you can figure it out. So I'll help you a little bit. If you, if you read it from top to bottom, it starts off with an L, and then in parentheses, a leaf falls, and then the L goes loneliness. So he used the metaphor idea of seeing the metaphor between being lonely and seeing a leaf falling, which is already kind of a neat, chilling metaphor. But then he even made it more, he made a double metaphor by actually writing it in a way where you could see the leaf falling. And so you actually get the metaphor experience in two different ways, and it really pulls the, the idea together. Um, uh, and then finally, there's Robert Frost, the king of metaphors. In fact, the road not taken is a metaphor, the idea of a road in, in life being, being connected. And I just wanted to show you this quote. I came across this by Robert Frost when he, this came from a, a talk that he gave at Amherst, in which... He said, the teacher must teach the pupil to think, of course. We still ask boys in college to think, but we seldom tell them it is just putting this and that together. It is saying one thing in terms of another. To tell them is to set their feet on the first rung of a ladder, the top of which reaches to the sky. 
The metaphor whose manage we are best taught in poetry, that is all there is of thinking. It may not seem far for the mind to go, but it is the mind's furthest. The richest accumulation of the ages is the noble metaphors we have rolled up. So um, education um, is about metaphors. So here's my hypothesis, that, that poetic skill corresponds in some degree to the ability of, of poets to form these cross-sensory and also cross-conceptual connections. So in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm maintaining, and there's no evidence to really support this, nobody has done this research, but my, my argument is that the poet is more likely to be synesthetic, and is more likely to have a brain, therefore, that's more tightly interconnected. So the final uh, 10 minutes? Five minutes. Ooh, five minutes. I just want to tell you a little bit about neuroscience, because that's sort of the final topic, and that is to, to look at what we might have learned about the synesthete's brain that could shed some light on, on synesthesia. So first of all, just a really quick uh, summary of what a normal brain does. If you look at, <coughs> at a normal brain, you can um, divide the brain up into specialized sensory regions. And so, for example, the back of the brain here is called the primary visual cortex, and that's where visual information is first processed. I already mentioned the temporal cortex, uh, the, the primary auditory cortex, tactile information. So there's really specific places in the brain where uh, sensory information gets first processed. And one of the puzzles that's been around for a long time is called the binding problem, and that is, given that our brains are processing sensory information in these different physical locations for the most part, how is it that we see our world as a unified thing? I mean, we don't, we're not aware, particularly when we're looking at ventriloquists, we're, we're not teasing those apart, as you think we might, given our brain architecture. And so this was actually a, a problem back when I was taking uh, psychology courses a long, long time ago, and it's still been something that people have been working on. And one of the original ideas was maybe there's a hierarchy where these uh, different sensory information uh, get start combined in association cortices, and then eventually you get to more and more higher levels of a hierarchy, so at the very top you have the final uh, idea. And that actually hasn't worked out. It seemed like that made intuitive sense, but that doesn't match what we've learned from uh, actually studying the brain and how it works. The quick, the short version of the answer as to how we do this binding thing is because our brain has massive interconnections. And so these different sensory, uh, primary sensory areas are processing sensory information, but they're also being connected to just about every other part of the brain. And that was sort of not appreciated until more recently, that the brain is massively interconnected. And so there's no brain region, even if it's primarily processing one sensory modality, there's no brain region that isn't also able to respond to other sensory modalities. And so that has suggested that maybe the difference between a synesthete and a, and a normal person is that perhaps a synesthete just has even more of those connections between certain brain regions. And that does seem to be the case. And um, huh. I'll just show you one of these examples. So this is a functional MRI, which is a technique that, that, you can, that is used to visualize the parts of the brain that are active or most active at any given time. And there's not enough time for you to really carefully look at this, but in this particular study, of this, and these are different slices through the brain of a synesthete, and these are different slices through the brain of a normal control subject. And what is being shown here is this area in blue is a region called V4, which is a visual region that codes color. And that's known. And so you can map that on a person by showing them colors, and you can figure out which part of the brain gets activated when they're seeing colors. Now, if you put a synesthete in the machine, and then you, um, uh, uh, let's see, in this case, it was, uh, it was a, a phoneme synesthete. So, you play, a, you play a tone that they see as a particular color. If you do that in your control, you don't see any overlap. So this yellow is where those regions get activated. Notice they get activated in the primary auditory cortex, which is what you'd expect. That's where they're processing the information. But you don't see very much activation down in this area that's processing color. However, when you look at the synesthete, you see there's a lot of crossover. So this is the V4, and there's, you can't, when you see that there's a red blush here, uh, which is highly active and a yellow blotch. And so that was a really exciting result that said that, yes, a synesthete, part of the brain that would normally be processing color is becoming active when they just hear a sound that they associate with that color. Mm -hmm. So their brain is really acting as, as you might expect given what, what, their, what their behavior is. And I'll skip over this next one. It's just basically the same thing. So the hypothesis is that it's 
that it's cross activation, and then the question is, is it just that synesthetes have more cross connections, or that that they aren't inhibiting each other as much? And the answer to that, the short answer, and I'm sorry to be rushing, but um, it turns out that it's the latter, that, that the difference between a synesthete and a normal person is not that they actually have more of these connections. They have just as many connections as we do. It's just that they don't inhibit each of these connections. And so in a normal working brain, if you're the visual part of the brain, you're getting input from other senses, but you just but that's in, being inhibited in that part of the brain normally because there's an inhibition that prevents that from happening. And this is being plotted here, so this is the area that's being activated, and it's leaving, it's exciting the adjacent area, but it's also inhibiting it, so you don't get activation in the adjacent part of the brain that would be producing, say, this is sound, particular sound, and this is a color. Whereas if you have less inhibition, then you actually will get this area activated. And that's kind of the current working idea of how the brain of a synesthete is, is unique from the brain of a, of a non-synesthete uh, in terms of there's just less inhibition. And that's supported by some stuff which I don't have time to go into, but I do really have to give you your final quiz. So there's actually acquired synesthesia, LSD produces it, sensory deprivation, um, but we have to take our final quiz uh, of the course. Okay. Ready? <laughs> Worth 100 points <laughs> and a diploma. <laughs> what component of the brain has not been studied at all to determine its possible role in synesthesia? Hint, it's a sticky matter. <laughs> glial cells. Um, it's wide open. Nobody, nobody has looked at glial cells, but they're a logical uh, suspect to look at because one of the things that glial cells we know do is they connect different parts of the brain together because you might have a single glial cell that's being activated over here and it will transmit information through the glial network to another region over here that could actually be responsible either for the loss of inhibition or some communication between different brain areas. And so it would seem to me that the glial cells would be a really logical place to look uh, neurobiologically for relationship to synesthesia. So with that, you all pass. We all were eager to learn more about the human brain. <clears throat> what secrets are within our skulls? Are we all nuts or sane? <laughs> so we decided to ask Clark to come so we could gain the knowledge we were looking for about this thing, the brain. We came to hear what he would say sometimes in snow and rain because we knew we would gain much. It would not be in vain. And sure enough, we did learn much. Our interest did not wane. He made it clear. He left no doubt that we're both nuts and saints. <laughs> Thank you, Nisha, and, and thank you, Clark. Didn't I tell you that this synesthesia was going to be exciting? Yes. Uh, I think we could go on with four more classes on it if we had time. Uh, next week, we are having an open Wednesday, and we're having one of your favorites back for the yes. day. Eric McIntyre, yes. and I've asked him to give just a short preview of what his class will be next week. I'll try to be as short as possible here and work in miniature, which is what I will do next week. Um, the musicologist Michael Steinberg said of uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony that uh, few musicians would say that the Ninth was the greatest symphony ever written, that it was the greatest of Beethoven's symphonies, or even their favorite among them. Uh, and yet, it is the ninth, and everyone knows that. Uh, the question 
I asked for a lot of people, is what did he do after the ninth? Did he just die? Uh, and in fact, it ties into Clark's question earlier about teaching the course before you kick the bucket, uh, which is, is, fits in my category for that. But also, what did Beethoven, after writing the ninth, want to do before he kicked the bucket? And what he ended up doing was writing string quartets. After this massive symphony with choir and huge orchestra, he wrote string quartets in the last year of his life. And they are some of the most amazing pieces ever written and really challenging. Uh, some of them, they still sound like they're modern. They might have been written last week. I still am trying to wrap my head around some of them. Uh, and yet, at the top of almost every list of greatest chamber pieces ever written is the C-sharp minor quartet, which is one of the very and so it's titled An Introduction to a Farewell, and it's looking at the music that Beethoven wrote right before he died, his circumstances. There's no way we can even start to scratch the surface, which is why I call it an introduction. Uh, but what I hope to do is entice those who have not encountered this music before uh, to really get to know it, because it is something that I think everybody should know before they kick the bucket. There's a lot of solace in this, and uh, it's very soothing and challenging and it's, it's remarkable and yet although I can't even scratch the surface I'll try to offer an introduction and if you already know the music maybe add some more context to it and all that in less than an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> It's an open Wednesday, so there's no registration and no tuition fee. I want to thank you all for coming, and especially Mary for adding to our course this morning. <laughs> Hope we did something for you, too. <laughs> uh, please leave your pick, uh, slips of paper on the table, and we will pick them up after class. Thank you for coming, and hope to see you all next week.